Hello, welcome to everyone who's joining us today. Thank you for attending this presentation by Nimco Ali. My name is Habiba Abdelayel and I'm the graduate assistant with the Women's Center at Ohio University. I'm also a fellow with the AHA Foundation, which has sponsored today's talk. The AHA Foundation works to end female genital mutilation, honor killing, and forced marriage. I also want to thank the Women's Center and the Multicultural Center for, for co-sponsoring today's presentation. We encourage you to engage with our, with our guest speaker today through the moderated and questions and answers function. We will send you some announcements through the chat, including instructions on how to post a question, as well as resources information for you. The topic that is being discussed today may be experience you have had or experience that those in your life have had. And today's session may cause you to want to explore issues further. We are providing local resources to counseling and advocacy, but also links to find resources specific to female genital mutilation through the AHA Foundation and the FIVE Foundation. And now I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, Nemko Ali. Nemko Ali OP is a, is a Somali British social activist and writer. She co-founded Daughters of Eve in 2010 and the FIVE Foundation in 2019, which leverages resources for frontline activists. She helped to position every GM as a central issue in ending violence against women and girls. Her professional experience has included working for counter-terrorism counter with, within the civil service, supporting the rights of girls in the UK as part of Girl Guiding UK and as, an, as network lead on the girl generation. The DFID funded uh, funded anti-FGM social change communications initiative. She's also a leading communicator in an international media on the rights of girls and women, particularly surrounding FGM and related issue. Nemco's debut book, What We Are Told Not To Talk About, was just published in 2014. She was awarded Red Magazine's Women of the Year Award and placed at number six on the Women's Hour Power list. Most recently, she was named by the Sunday Times as one of the Debrates 500 most influential people in Britain, well as one of the Evening Standard's 1,000 most powerful and BBC's 100 women. Please join me in welcoming her through the chat. Thank you very much, um, Habiba, and thank you very much for the Women's Centre um, of Ohio University and the Ayan Hirsi Foundation for um, having me here today to talk about female genital mutilation, which is um, a personal issue to myself and something that um, over 200 million women globally have um, been subjected to. So if I just go in a brief explanation of what female genital mutilation is, so F, which is abbreviated as FGM. FGM is the total or partial removal of the or damage to the female anatomy for non-medical reasoning. Um, FGM is global, um, has a global presence where, um, but the main focus of of, of, um, of FGM is 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 within the African continent, where more than 28 countries have more than a 40% uptake of FGM. Um, for someone like me who's of Somali heritage, Somalia, um, whether the Somali community, be they living in Somalia, Somaliland, Ethiopia, or, or, or Kenya, have the largest have the largest percentage, with 98% of Somali women having been subjected to FGM. Um, the highest population of, of women who have been subjected to FGM on the continent of Africa are um, Egyptian women, where 91% of FGM is prevalent and 71% of that is um, medicalized. FGM can happen in several settings, so we know that it happens in rural communities and we also know that it happens in medicalized settings and that's one of the key kind of evolving trends um, that has been identified since FGM was um, codified and announced as a human rights violation, but within the within the World Health Organization context, there has been a massive focus on the harm of FGM rather than the human rights and the and the abuse of FGM. This has ultimately led to people trying to mitigate the consequence of FGM, leaving it leading us to where we're now having more, more and more medical professionals actually carrying out FGM. Um, 
In terms of what's the role, um, so what are the rates of FGM? As I said, so it's 28 countries. Most of those are in sub-Sahara. Um, so we've got Sudan, we've got um, Eritrea, Ethiopia, and then to West Africa, where we have Gambia, um, Burkina Faso. We have Nigeria, which which has a less than 24, um, less than about 20 percent. But ultimately, with the with the population of Nigeria, that is still uh, massive. Senegal. So you can actually see that there is a massive wave of FGM and um, gender-based violence across the continent of Africa. And one of the key kind of primaries of why I call this talk um, FGM, an African problem with an African solution, it's not just saying that the fact that this is only in Africa, but it's focused in Africa. And if we are going to achieve the, 20, um, the 2030 target of having a world free of FGM, we have to be able to focus on the primary place where it's evident on the African continent. Um, between now and 2030, there are seven 70 million women and girls at risk of FGM and because of COVID two extra million women have been added to that. Um, COVID, what, what COVID has done is actually really shown the belly of the beast of the real inequalities and the way that we look at women um, globally but specifically on the continent of Africa. We have spent the last um, almost three decades um, looking at development without actually looking at economic development democratic development and social development of 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 the African continent still to date um, the the bride price and marriage is the key um, economic factors within Africa so women in Africa are only secure financially only within the context of marriage and when marriage is happening then those contracts are between two men so the man that's the father and the man that's about to marry the daughter so essentially as we had in the West about a hundred years ago women are still being used as a commodity to be parted with so in parts of Kenya, if I want to buy um, um, if I want to buy a cow and I don't have any money, I have a daughter. I exchange the daughter with that. And at the basis of um, this, the commodification of women is, is, is also the objectivization of women. So girls are being basically FGM at a local and community level is seen as an economic investment. FGM is not happening for free. FGM is not being done for free and FGM is not being done in the context of ignorance. You have to actually make several conscious decisions in order for FGM to happen. And the key primary to that is what is the value added to the girl if FGM is done? This is one of the kind of the key um, premises of why we started the Five Foundation was to ultimately talk about where the role the FGM plays in the intersection between gender equality, poverty and real democratic um, empowerment of women on, on the continent of Africa. So if you look at so looking at the biggest commodity on the continent of Africa being women and being trade and women being traded between um, men, if you pay a hundred dollars in order for your daughter to be cut, that's that that that's a hundred dollars added at a local community basis. But when you look at it at a national G um, G GDP, FGM costs developed countries up to one and a half billion dollars a year in terms of medical needs and the consequences coming through FGM and. Let me talk about those consequences. Um, there are three, um, th um, there are three category, um, categories of FGM, which is defined by the World Health Organization. And I talk about these three different characteristics because they're there for medical intervention. But I do not wish, and I will never grade the levels of FGM. Every single woman, every the, every single one of the 200 million women in the world living with FGM has their own experience, and from type one to type three. The invasive nature might be different, but the personal experience is something that needs to be respected. So um, in saying that, type 1 FGM is the clitoridectomy. So it's basically um, either a partial removal of the external part of the clitoris or just a, a tiny removal of the, the, the hood of the clitoris. And, and, and I say the external part of the clitoris because ultimately 80% of the clitoris is internal. So there are, there are misconceptions of of, of the fact that women who've had FGM have had their clitoris removed. The external parts of the clitoris are removed in most cases of type 1 and type 2 FGM. And type 2 FGM is um, total or partial removal of the external part of the clitoris and then also some removal of the um, external labias of the of either the majora or the minora because these um, forms of FGM when codified were not being done by medical professions. The gradings came around in order for people just to understand the damage that was being done to women. And type three, which is the most invasive and, and the one that literally 
um, got the World Health Organization to stand on its, like, you know, st stand up and take notice. It's called infibulation. So this is either part one, either type one or type two FGM can be um, part, um, can be carried out, but essentially type three is categorized by whatever um, parts of the labia majora or um, the labia majora or minora are left being pulled together and stitched together. This is called infibulation, and um, this is most common in, um, in Ethiopia, Egypt, Somalia, Somaliland, Sudan. So that part of like, you know, North, North and East Africa have a, a high prevalence rating of type 3 FGM. There has been some of that reported in, 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 in West Africa. This again comes back to this whole conversation that I saw as I was growing up about the purification of women and keeping them pure. Ultimately, it's actually keeping a product that you have like, you know, deemed as valuable to you. So that's the chastity and the virginity of a girl in order for you to give when you are about to um, part way with that girl. Um, ultimately, the main the main risk consequence of FGM is death. We say survivors because there are 200 million women living with the consequence of FGM. Unfortunately, because of the way that data is connected, we don't know how many women have died or how many women or girls have died when FGM was being practiced or how many women and girls have died without ever seeing any medical um, medical intervention. Many of the infibulations um, which is type 3 FGM, have um, um, are de-infibulated at birth, but this is only if women are lucky enough to have birth attendants to understand the complexities of FGM or they're in a medical setting. But, um, but one of the key things is that if, if, the, if, if, the, if the FGM is not um, undone in, in terms of the infibulation not happening, when women are giving birth, there could be severe complications and again, leading to death. So FGM, the kind of, linkage between women dying in childbirth and FGM is there, it's vast. So when we talk about the risk of death from FGM, it's not just at the point of FGM happening, but also like, you know, um, after that, when women are basically at risk because of giving birth or even having intercourse, there can also be infections caused by FGM because many of the times it's not done in sanitary um, um, conditions and because it's a non-medical procedure, this means that it could lead to women bleeding. And as, as, we've, as, as, um, as we've seen in Egypt in the last um, few years, even when it's done within the context of a, of a medical setting, there have been reactions to, um, to antibiotics or um, so some of the drugs are being given to young girls and they have died. Um, other severe complications from um, FGM are unitary infections, again, bleeding. And then the long term consequences of FGM are severe scarring and um, difficulties in urinating and also when giving birth. Um, so as much as we talk about the health consequences of FGM, because that's where it sits within the World Health Organization, there are severe psychological and social um, and social and um, social com um, impacts of FGM. I can talk about this as somebody that has grown up in this side of the world in the West and as a survivor of FGM, the emotional impact of FGM can be is lifelong and it takes uh, several years of um, both therapy and personal um, struggles in order for you to be able to deal with that. But but very little of that um, of those services are actually available to women, let alone on the continent of Africa, but even within Europe or America. And I think that's one of the key things that I would love to touch on um, afterwards in terms of uh, question and answer um, sessions. Um, one of the, so in terms of the work with FGM, like, you know, in Africa, in the work incredibly in order to end FGM is being done by um, activists who are within those communities, but, but only two, only only one percent of international development funding goes to directly to gender specific issues and very little of that actually goes to frontline activism. Um, there are women on the like so Kenya is, is the most successful country in terms of ending FGM where they're down to almost negligible numbers of under 10 percent. A lot of that has been about lifting women out of poverty. The key element in terms of ending FGM is not telling people it's bad because people know it's bad and many of the women who have had FGM have experienced that physically so they know the harms and the pain that FGM is but it's about giving women access to opportunities, economic justice and the ability to choose and have choices over your body and over your life are key to really ending FGM. Um, and this is why I said, like, you know, this is an African problem with an African solution. 51% of Africa's population, which is women, are not economically engaged. They're not democratically empowered and therefore they have very little choice about what happens to them. 
we can tell people FTM is bad, but unless we give women access to economic employment where they have money, and once you have money and once you have the ability to be able to live outside your community and your circle and to make individual choices, what you do is you choose who you marry, when you want to marry, how many kids you want to have, and how you raise those kids. And it's very rare and solemn have I ever met, if even at all, I actually have to say 100% at all, have I met a woman that has been given the opportunity to actually have have choice and chosen to have her daughters cut. We talk, um, if, we, if, if, if you look at someone like Egypt where FGM is still within the 90 um, percent, um, one of the key th one of the key things about Egypt is that everyone talks about Egypt being a, a developed for like you know close to first world as possible in Africa. Why is FGM still happening? W when it comes to development um, and economic power and democratic power, women hold none of that. So it's not about how much money a country has, but how much money women hold within their families and within their own communities and what kind of choices those things make. If we talk about those that are working on the issue of FGM, um, like, 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 like I said, we've got a woman called Edna Arden, who is a Somali woman, was in the 19, um, late 70s, early 80s, went to the UN and actually asked for FGM to be um, codified and to really for, for them to ratify against an act of violence that was um, that, that was killing women. And it's really interesting that she says that they had to protest outside the UN in order for them to be listened to, because again, FGM was seen as a development issue rather than human rights issue. And that is, if I can leave you with one thing, the consequences of FGM are health and they're social and they're economical, but the foundation and the roots of FGM are about inequality and oppression. It is it is a, it is about keeping 50% of the population of those countries um, um, enslaved and 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 held within the principle of them just being only viable as wives and as mothers and not actually as equal and as active citizens. Like, you know, just as we see um, acts of um, domestic violence, as we see rape, as we see um, other forms of um, sexual violence um, with, um, in in this side of the world as violence against women and girls, it is really the same thing about FGM as well. This is rooted about the fact that women are not seen as equal to men. So in order for her to actually be more, more valuable, then she has to be harmed. And as somebody that has um, grown up with the whole consequences and the, and, and the issues of FGM, I've, I've heard the very um, anthropological takes about the experiences of women like me as though it's the fact that this was something that was part of our culture. There is no cult, there, there is no cultural justifications for for violence against women and girls. I mean, we don't justify. Um, so what was it like, you know, um, 3000 years ago or even 2000 years ago, um, twins were being buried for being seen as a curse. We don't like, you know, um, justify the burning of women because they might be witches. So the idea of the fact that the humanity of African women can be left to this concept of it being culture and not being um, respected as 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 much as somebody else is something that's like you know a massive um, fallacy and then ultimately religion there is no religion there is no religious text that actually talks about the consequence uh, that talks about FGM as as being something that's fundamentally um, required. There are people that will want to read into that, but there is no um, level of evidence in that. And you can also talk about the fact that re re religion has to evolve with the state. And if there is legislation against something, then it has to evolve with that. And then I want to kind of like, you know, before I um, leave it out to questions, which I find a lot more helpful in terms of really understanding this, I really wanted to differentiate between language. So one of the key things is that we talk about female genital mutilation and it is mutilation. The act is cutting. So there's a process of removing the anatomy through cutting. But the idea, the fact that we can call FGM female genital cutting, like, you know, takes away from the gravitas and the legal nature of the conversations that we need to have. The female anatomy, once subjected to the brutality, of of um 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 of FGM cannot be put back to its original state, and I think that is the fundamental thing that we have to understand. The word mutilation, as much as like you know the brutality of it, like talks to a legal consequence of what is happening to women. It actually talks to, to the gravity of the oppression and the human rights of women. And there are many people who I have worked with and who I have conversations with who constantly want to talk about the fact of not offending and trying to talk about softer language. If you are in a state of talking to survivors, it, it's a lot. It, it, it's about allowing survivors 
to lead that conversation and have that conversation. But when we're in the geopolitical context of actually trying to advocate on behalf of women, we have to be honest, we have to be brave and we have to talk about an act as um, as brutal and as 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 as, as the way it is. So within that is to actually say that um, that the lang that that and um, that language matters and also credit matters as well. Again, it's like it's women on the continent of Africa that are suffering after and it's women on the continent of Africa that are leading this conversation. And even within the diaspora is women like myself who are from the continent who are saying this is what needs to happen. This is what needs to change. And if I can kind of touch on that in, in terms of the Western prospect of it is that if in America or the United Kingdom that people are working with with survivors of FGM, one of the things that has been lacking is the ability to sympathise and see the humanity and also the suffering of women. There has been a lot of voyeurisms in, in terms of the way that we deal with consequences and um, with the consequence of FGM. And there's always been a lot of um, cultural relativism. For example, when I was growing up, I had FGM when I was seven. I had a very invasive form of FGM, which led to me being hospitalised at, at the age of 11. So being in a major legal con construct, which is the NHS, and social construct, which is the National Health Service within the UK, and, and the act of violence that was committed against me being very evident to those that were around me and, and had a duty of care, but yet unable to question because they felt culturally sens uh, culturally um they thought it would be culturally insensitive are the kind of things that we've been trying to deal with on this side of the on this side of the continent um i mean on on this on this side of the global north because of the fact that people thought they had to put the girl's culture before the fact that she had any um rights i think that's something that you guys in the us are about to get your um you're about to get into because of the fact that you have um, an emerging and, and 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 growing community or population that's that that's at risk of, that is at risk of FGM and I think working with those especially within the health professional context is to really understand the patient and the individual before you actually project the culture and the assumptions that you have about the culture and the act of violence it's really about trying to listen to the woman her story and her needs in saying that also understanding that um, where FGM is evident, risk factors are higher. So if you come across a girl who has, or a woman who's had FGM, who's identifying um, physical and, and emotional um, symptoms of FGM, and you deal with those things, also understand that any other child, female child in that family is at risk. This is one of the key things that we've had an issue here within the UK, saying that this was about stigmatising and targeting communities. We deal with issues of violence against women and girls, such as domestic violence, rape, child abuse. We we understand the indicators of that. So if you are in a household with a person who's been convicted of domestic violence or there is history of domestic violence, then the state has the, has the right in order to intervene and ask questions about the well-being of a child in that space. It's exactly the same for anybody that you know where FGM has been evident and there is a risk of FGM. Just last week, we had um, a leading FGM um, charity or a charity that specifically works on ending FGM saying that um, ethnic minority communities feel like they're being targeted and, and picked on because of regulations in order to protect people from FGM. And it's quite weird for me as somebody that led on the work in order for, for, um, for, for us to have more interventions and somebody also that grew up um, behind the scenes of um, FGM being ignored because we might be seen as um, being racist or culturally in, 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 um, um, insensitive, insensitive, that 30 years on people that we're paying money to are actually complaining about the fact that we're doing enough work. So for those who are working in the sector, I think putting the humanity of your um, patient first, but then also putting the rights of the, um, any girl at risk at the forefront of any cultural um, um, sensitivities is it's, 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 it's something that I would um, really um, push out on. And then I'll, I'll just talk about a little bit about the Five Foundation, which is um, the partnership. It's a global partnership to end FGM and to get direct funding and resources to women who are at the forefront of this. Like I said, um, only 1% um, of funding goes to gender specific um, um, work and very little of that goes to women that are on the continent of Africa. And when and when you look at um, issues around funding and in FGM, 
Um, at the moment, there's about 50 cents per woman at risk of FGM um, globally being spent. And, and that's basically looking at all the kind of philanthropy and other bilaterals that have given to this issue. But then when, when you look at something like HIV and AIDS, there's $750 per person at risk um, of um, at risk or suffering um, or living with um, living with HIV and AIDS. So there is a massive um, disparity between like, you know, the vocal conversations of trying to end FGM by 2030, how much money we actually put into the conversation around ending, 20, um, ending FGM and how we fund that. And we're not going to be able to achieve any of these changes unless we support the women who are really at the forefront of um, fighting this campaign. So um, thank you very much for listening and happy to take questions. Thank you so very much. Um, we do have a couple of questions in the chat, but I also think, oh, I also, um, we do have a couple of questions in the chat, but I also think some of them are ones that you kind of addressed, but I want to create opportunity in case there's anything that you want to elaborate on. Um, one person asked, do you think it's cultural, economic, or generational that FGM continues to exist in today's society, especially since global government um, entities and society as a whole frowns upon it today. And I think you spoke a lot to the economic powers at play that have perpetuated it, but is there anything else that you want to add? Yeah, um, I think there's been a real massive misunderstanding of the causes of FGM. So we've spent literally almost um, 40 years talking about FGM as a health issue. And really, and when I first started my activism, it was about trying to change the language. So we talked about eradicating FGM as though it was a virus. And it's not about eradicating FGM, but it's about ending it. And how do we end it? It is through economic means. It is about actually giving women in Africa the opportunities to make money and have choices and also getting governments to really understand um, that women are part of their GDP, they're part of their ability to, in order to scale up and actually lift themselves out of poverty. So if they want to be able to live out of poverty, reduce the birth rates in those countries and ensure that natural resources do not run out, it's about really protecting citizens. So it is fundamentally about economic, like giving women access to economic um, justice, giving them access to education and giving them access to the ability to really um, partake in, in, in the democratic process. So I do think that there is um, a massive um, kind of common ground that FGM is bad and we need to end it, but there's very little understanding in terms of how we need to do that. And the real, the real answer is about investing in Africa's female future. If only if you invest in women, and where and where the um, experts and the struggle is, then can you end FGM? So um, hopefully that answers that question. Thank you. And I think to this point of of ending. Um, there's a question in the chat about how can we as peers, as educators and administrators best support those who have experienced FGM? Um, I think one of the key things is about giving somebody space. So especially from this conversation that I'm having at the moment, I like, you know, I don't I you know, I would definitely ask people not to go up and start speaking to Somali young women or Eritrean or Ethiopian young women and ask them whether they've had FGM. That is something that used to happen um, when I was growing up, when there was a, um, an awareness raising about FGM, then everybody would directly come up to um, me to ask questions. It was valid the fact that I was Somali, like, you know, by by sheer statistics, probably I would have had FGM, but the idea, the fact that I wasn't treated with the respect and the humanity to have my own story and be ready to tell it when I want to tell it was something that was very um, uncomfortable. When he, one of my um, best friends was telling me um, um, a few years ago where where she, um, a teacher had read about FGM in one of our big newspapers here in the UK, and he cut it out and just like basically slipped that into her kind of like you know corner and said if you ever want to talk of course she felt humiliated um, humiliated because as much as she was an FGM survivor from an ethnic minority community she was also having the same emotions that any British woman would have had about her body so I think as educators as peers and as people that care like create safe space um, let, let, let people let your friends even your friends don't even directly ask your friends let people know that there's space for them to come to you if, if they want to 
and in, in terms of services within the university and around, um, please say that they're open to everybody and understanding that women of colour, even from ethnic minority groups that are new to the con um, to the country, um, have emotional and psychological needs. So I think be respectful, be kind and just be ready if somebody does come to you. And this notion of allyship is really being repeated quite a bit in the questions that I'm seeing from the audience. And so I just want to acknowledge that there are a lot of people who are in this space who are committed to finding ways to amplify voices of women who are at risk for FGM, but who also don't want to perpetuate marginalization or to make people uncomfortable um, in the ways that you have just very, uh, very wonderfully described. And so um, but I also want to acknowledge that some of these questions are also tied in with comments that they want to make to you in terms of saying that your presentation has been very powerful and moving and thank you so much for sharing your experiences as well. Um, another person has a question in regards to what percentage of survivors, if at all possible, are able to have FGM reversed and I'm assuming that they mean in terms of what does medical care look like um, in regards to the physical impact of FGM and what does treatment look like? Um, yeah, so there are there are several um, kind of um, ways in terms of supporting women who who've had FGM. Um, I would never say that it can be reversed because it's ultimately um, removing an anatomy that can't be um, replaced. So, for example, if you've had type three FGM, which I had, which is called infibulation, there is the deinfibulation, which is um, opening of the um, anatomy that was stitched together. And sometimes, depending on what the damage that was done by the cutter. So, for example, one of my best friends um, recently, um, she was 30, like at the age of 35. So she was 30 when she had um, five when she had FGM and 30 years later had um, her infibulation. And at the time when she was before she was deinfibulated, so had her anatomy reopened, she had type three FGM. By the time it was deinfibulated, she had non-categorized FGM because her clitoris had been left. So what the cutter had done, or the circumciser, or this woman, or, um, the kind of the perpetrator. Actually, let's call them the perpetrators of FGM because they're not circumcisers. Um, so the perpetrators of FGM had done is just basically stitch her anatomy together. So when that was reopened, it meant that she had no um, other me physical medical um, needs. There are women who have had their basically their um, external part of their clitoris removed. So sometimes if that has been hidden behind um, be be behind scar tissue, that might not be able to be undone. So ultimately, um, the the needs and, and the, the needs of FGM survivors are diverse, and it all depends on the woman um, and her experience. And ultimately, because a lot of the procedures are not being done by medically trained people, it, it's about trying to support that um, survivor in, in a way to make her life um, bearable. Many of those services, actually, I'm not sure how available they are in the um, US. But in in the in in the UK, we, we women can directly access um, physical um, services through our NHS and now through our general practitioners. You can ask for these things. Um, ultimately, what I would say, which is linked, which is lacking on a massive scale, is the need for um, psychological support for survivors um, of female genital mutilation and actually really understanding the trigger points that women might have in terms of when they give birth um, and so on. So yeah, so the services out there are are vast and the needs of women are diverse depending on her um, circumstances. Thank you so much. Another question is, is how are people able to determine the scope of the issue? So how are people able to find out how many people have been um, victimized by FGM or survivors of FGM? And how do you get an idea for how expansive this is around the globe or in places outside of Africa? Um, so yeah, so in the UK, um, so I'll just speak to the UK in, in terms of like, you know, the activism that I did and the kind of results of that. So in, in 2013, we lobbied the head of the um, health service here in the UK to put in a code where every single woman in, in the United Kingdom would, would be asked, has she had FGM? So it wasn't just about asking women from certain ethnic minorities. Before 2013, the way that stats were being done was basically looking at how many women had in their census identified as being an ethnic minority community where FGM is prevalent, where more than um, 40% and those are some she had FGM and then assumption that her child would have FGM or be at risk. 
now that we have the ability for women to self-disclose and ask and, and, and be asked these conversations, we, we, we went from the guesstimation of 66,000 women to actual data of close to 140,000 women in the UK living with the consequences of FGM. Many of those women had been cut prior to moving to the UK, so they'd come as refugees or settled in, 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 in the UK before they had FGM. Many, like me, had been cut before it was illegal to take girls out of the country, so it only became illegal to um, take British girls out of the country and have them subjected to FGM. That only became illegal in 2003, even though we had legislation against FGM since 1985. Um, in terms of globally, we know where FGM is evident. So we like, you know, pre-existing data in terms of like the Somali community, the Somalia, Egypt, Ethiopia. And then every three to four years, there is um, um, a health survey that is done by um, both um, by by the UN and the data is collected that way. And UNFPA has um, so UNFPA, so which is the UN Joint Program on Ending FGM, has um, up to date data of where FGM is prevalent and where and and and, and what the stats are. Outside of the continent of Africa, the largest population, um, concentrated population, which is actually quite vast, is in Indonesia and Malaysia, where FGM is also up to the 50%. And sadly, within both Indonesia and Malaysia, um, FGM has been medicalized. So there is this whole legitimization of FGM through medicalization. But I do think that in terms of really ending the source of the problem in Africa, then we'll actually ensure that there is no excuse for all these people that are doing it in both in, in, in Indonesia and Malaysia, where well, what they do is not dissimilar to things that we're having done here in the UK called labiaplasty, but it's just being done on children. So there, because of this whole conversation around FGM being done through ignorance and, and, and because people are barbaric, there actually has been a seeping in of that misogyny through this idea of choice. Um, and what and the reason for me why I'm very specific of calling it female genital mutilation is because an act of mutilation is um, GBH, which is which is grievous body harm, which is an act of violence that you cannot consent to and the state has control over. But because when it happens to women's bodies, it's fine. So in the UK that we're in this quandary where if you're of an African descent like myself, you can't have certain procedures. Um, in certain private hospitals because it, 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 it's classified as FGM. But if you're um, white or non-African descent, it's called labiaplasty. And then there's some kind of choice that's built into that. And that all comes from this idea of the fact of seeing FGM not as a form of violence and oppression, but ultimately seeing it as a form of ignorance. I, I really appreciate you talking about that intersection, right, in terms of how the notion of choice is understood and as it connects to issues of race as, as well as gender. Um, and someone has um, said a little bit about how they really see that the patriarchy contributes to FGM and this notion of how women are situated within society. Um, but then other people are also raising this question of how how do we properly end FGM? Is it by doing additional sort of programs that lift women up economically or provide better education? Or what does that look like? Because I'm also hearing you say it's it's not necessarily just ignorance. There is this perpetuation of, of labiaplasty and other sorts of things that do try to um, tell, you know, people who have vaginas what their vaginas should look like. Yeah, there is a um, there is a powerful thing. So the whole thing about the global north south and divide kind of conversation, where it is ultimately in terms of um, in the developing countries and especially in Africa, it is about it is about lifting women out of poverty and um, and then in this side of the world, it's actually about really being um, very clear about the concept of choice. I think there is there is zero informed choice in terms of the procedures that are done to women in terms of the female anatomy. So some people can kind of compare it to things like breast augmentations and so on. Those are not mutilating um, and changing the functions of um, parts of the body which can't be reversed back. So there are completely different kind of consequences and um, co um, conversations around the informedness of, of the consent that to women are given to labiaplasty. But ultimately and fundamentally, in terms of ending FGM on a mass scale, it is about economically empowering women. The 70 million girls at risk of FGM between now and 2030 
haven't been born yet most of them haven't been born and they're all going to be born to adolescent young girls who unless we create um, economic opportunities for them are going to be married off as second wives or third wives to older men were bought I said like you know I think we use the concept of marriage quite legit um, in a legitimate way to something that's quite brutal bought and those kids are going to be born um, and those kids are going to bear more children but if you give women access to economic empowerments then she chooses not to get married or she chooses to get married when she wants to and chooses how many kids that she has and just even comparing ourselves to our grandmothers on this side of the world, um, our grandmothers had little choice in terms of like, you know, getting married and getting divorced to the point where people make stats about how how um, how very few people are like, you know, having children in wedlock and how marriage and um, how my marriages are crumpling. The reason why divorce is so high it's because the fact that women actually have the choice to get divorced now and women have the ability to be able to live without being um, secure in a marriage in order to um, sustain whatever livelihoods that they have. So we have to wish for our sisters on, on the continent of Africa the same as we wish for ourselves. So, yeah, I do actually ultimately think that fundamentally um, economic empowerment and economic development is key to ending FGM. Thank you. One of the things that you said earlier in your talk is that there's been some concerns among healthcare professionals about like wanting to do something, but also being worried about um, stepping on people's culture and cultural insensitivity. And someone's posed the question of what sort of trainings or engagements are organizations like the Phi Foundation doing with medical schools or national health organizations to increase awareness and the appropriate response um, for healthcare providers? so they can be better allies. So yes, yeah, so we, um, so the Five Foundation's main focus is on trying to resource um, funding for women on the front line of this fight, um, as opposed to directly working with, 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 with health professionals. But here in the UK, prior to the Five Foundation, when I set up Lords of Eve, a lot of that work was with government agencies and really actually getting the government to put in piece of legislation and training that made sure that um, that people were sensitive enough in, in terms of the way that they asked questions and really understood that FGM wasn't um, a cultural practice, but it was a form of violence against women and girls. Um, and in 2019, we had FGM added to the Children's Act, so to be seen as a form of violence. So for me specifically, somebody that has lived, well, actually, as well, uh, as one of the only activists in the West and in well in Europe that um, has lived um, through every stage of um, the main institutions, um, um, that being education, hospital, and then also in employment in terms of um, like you know being existed within the legislation of the of. Of, of, the, of the country, I've seen how easy it is to other and to, and to kind of not see the um, child beyond the culture and beyond the race. And we've actually been able to elevate that by ensuring that FGM is seen as a specific issue of violence, is seen as specific issues as harm. So teachers are aware, health professions are aware, and now um, um, police are aware as well in order to deal with that. But in terms of anything to do with um, violence against women and girls broadly, there is um, very little understanding in, in terms of the sensitivities of the way that we need to deal with um, survivors. And we've seen that both with domestic violence and, 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 and sexual violence, sadly, as well. But things are changing, but ultimately because FGM is being um, loudly and clearly defined as violence. Thank you. Um, we have people that are really interested in the work that you have done, right, in terms of co-founding the Five Foundation, and they're wondering if you can speak to a little bit about what that process of co-founding this organization was like, um, but then also if you faced resistance um, from people who are pro-FGM as you're conducting your advocacy work and what that is like. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, it's been really interesting. So I've had two um, kind of um, lifespans in terms of the fact that when I first started the work around FGM around just 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 under 11 years ago, it was around working on FGM within the UK. So really elevating to the issue to taking it from a community cultural relativism issue into violence against women and girls. And it was really interesting because when I first um, I was in my early 20s when I described FGM as um, violence against women and girls. And it was very interesting that the very um, white 
white working class left feminist community were very much like, oh, well, we can't call her that because it's different. We need to really understand it. And I was very much sitting there thinking, well, actually, it is violence. Like the reason why I had it wasn't because I was Somali or, or Muslim or in Africa. It was because I was a girl. There was something about my gender, which is very specific to why it happened. That, that, that evolved. And then al along the same time, I was having the pushback from my community to to not like, you know, how dare I speak about something that was so uh, personal and so sensitive. So th those were really difficult times, but ultimately it was about standing my ground and saying, well, you can't actually expect me to assimilate and integrate into a country as a British citizen. But then when it comes to a harmful thing that's happening to you, then step back and see me as a Somali or through the lens of a culture, which actually I never chose to be born into. So I can say that was very difficult and really getting the, the the UK government behind behind me because of the fact that I spoke to the humanity rather than the like you know the actual brutality of the issue of FGM really changed that. So the first thing that, that we did was actually get the um the UK government to articulate that it was a form of violence against women and girls and it was and it and and it was happening because of gender inequalities rather than happening through um ignorance. And then secondly it was that to, to really understand that they had a role to play. So we were very successful in that. Um, but there was a massive personal to um, toll in the in the in in the in in the sense that my personal story was leading the conversation, and I had to, and there was a lot of voyeurism from um, journalists and people who weren't really in interested in my humanity, but just more about the entertainment um, aspect of of my experience. Um, I'm glad to say, like you know, that really paid off. But in the last um, like you know two three years since we since since we co-founded the Five Foundation, I think what's been really palatable and really kind of like stark has been um, has been the racism and the sexism which women on the continent of Africa are receiving that's why they don't get funding to the to the to the way that I get that is it is quite ironic how many times something that I've said about three or four times gets articulated um, like you know less like you know less of, like you know to, to the point that I like you know yeah, gets gets said and gets articulated as um, the way that I did it by somebody who's not black and who's not a woman and then is seen as like you know groundbreaking. So when it comes to the work that the Five Foundation is doing, it is not it is not actually the pushback that I'm getting from um, from my ethnic minority communities who all actually are backing me and and governments and agencies are really standing with me. It is very much about the public sector um, in terms of the government's workings and also philanthropy that seem to not understand that. Um, actually, I don't, to, to be honest, I think they don't believe that, um, that non-Europeans and non-Anglo-Saxons um, actually have the ability to make free will and choice. So there's this real conversation about the fact that we have to keep baby in the continent of Africa and that leads to why we're not being like, you know, why women are not being funded. So it's um, both the experiences that I've had in terms of um, being a co-founder of a foundation and, and an organisation that led the work around FGM have been very personally um, painful, but painful in two different ways. The first one was ultimately about my personal experience and me being physically attacked. And then this one is actually really more about the erosion of your integrity because of the fact that people can't just deal with somebody who they want to see as a victim actually being the leader in a position. and. I'm hoping that we can actually overcome that and actually see that that you know like you know that black and African women are complex and they do have the ability to lead themselves out of poverty and oppression. Um, I think you're the treatment that you're describing in the media right and how people are listening to your voice or accrediting your ideas to other people um, is a question that has or is it is what's potentially raised this question of what guidance do you have for journalists who are covering this topic um, and who are covering these speakers so that it's not becoming this voyeuristic thing about one person's experiences but providing um, resource and information uh, that you would like to see? I think it's really following the principle of do no harm. So in terms of writing about something and engaging, are you moving the thing? Are you moving the conversation forward? Um, I ultimately, I do think like, you know, there is space for discourse. And in terms of like, you know, you can say maybe the way um, in terms of the way that I say something might not necessarily be correct or whatever it is, but ultimately it is about, are you are you talking about the person? Are you, are you bringing a personal opinion and conversation to this? Or are you trying to actually really listen and advocate and, and, 
and 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 support in order to achieve a goal. So I think it's like you know we 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 need more media, we need more conversations, we need people that are not necessarily survivors of FGM or from those communities in order to talk about the issue. But the reality is when you talk about it, are you doing it for the right reasons and are you actually moving things forward or could you be pulling things back? Thank you. And there's another question in terms of, you know, the those who are at risk for FGM are, are young. Um, and when we think about um, some of the laws that you've talked about in terms of, you know, it wasn't illegal to take a girl out of the country until relatively recently. Um, one of the questions is what what do folks do if they are um, feeling that they are at risk for FGM? What sort of resources are available to minors and how can they navigate um, a system to 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 advocate for themselves and protect themselves. Um, so the so the US has just passed legislation in terms of um, banning FGM, which is um, a lot of that credit is due to um, the Ayan Hersey Foundation um, in terms of really um, pushing on that. So I can't really speak to state by state in the US, but in terms of the UK, um, statutory agencies, so health, education are all basically tasked with dealing with um, with like the protection of children that have had FGM. I think one of the things that I would wish and I would really like, and I, I don't know how your um, systems work, but in the UK, I think every woman that has had, has had every woman that has had FGM should be given um, support, you know, as soon as she gives birth in order to help her guide um, her through the, um, the, 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 like, you know, being a mother and really understanding her body and what, and what happens. In, in the UK, we have things called health visitors who basically from when you're discharged from the midwife, so after two weeks or um, past your birth, you are um, given a community-based um, health worker. And those community-based health workers work with people such as like, you know, so we're women who are vegan, who are exclusive breastfeeding, have one-to-one -one contact in terms of like making sure that they eat the right food and so on. I actually don't think it's that dissimilar to support women who've, who, who've gone through FGM in order to understand like, you know, what, what it is to be um, a mother and all the kind of com complexities that will go, um, like, you know, um, um, come with that. But outside of that, in the UK, we have like, you know, we have awareness in, in terms of like if you are concerned about something that there's a, a number you can call and you get talked through, which is um, which is the NSPCC, which is a national charity for, for children. Teachers are made aware, healthcare professionals are made aware. So there is that there is checks and balances. But I'm really happy to say that there are fewer girls at risk of FGM here in the UK because women are getting the opportunities to make choices. And I think um, even, even though my mother was an educated woman, she was a woman without the ability to say whether I could or could not have FGM, but she did have the choice in order for me to be educated to the point that I am, where I where I am today in my like you know in my mid thirties, unmarried, without children, able to able to provide for myself, and I know I will never do FGM because I won't have that. I won't have to do FGM on my children because I won't have the pressure or even the 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 fear that my daughter will not be accepted into a a certain community or idea. So ultimately, I, it's about for us at the moment, which I think um, is quite amazing, is that FGM is seen like any other form of abuse and we all collectively have a responsibility in order to pre protect children. And kind of to this notion of, of who it is that is going to be able to disrupt some of these patterns and someone's asking, you know, is FGM mostly promoted by men or have women been promoting FGM? And in that same kind of sense, when we think about ending FGM, um, is that something where where women are supporting it, men are supporting it? What does that look like? It's honestly, it's quite psychosomatic. It's like it's it's one of those things where um, there was research done, which again was in a F, um, which is in a UN um, re report. But I wish it could be shared through um, technological platforms like Facebook, where 71% of a certain community, like 71% of people in Eritrea want FGM to end, but those 71% 71 71 of those people were asked personally, but it's about sharing that information. So there is a very much um, cult mob mentality of, of, the, of the fact that unless you carry out FGM, nobody's going to be accepted, and that's just the way that it does. So because those in power actually benefit from FGM, they don't ever want to disrupt that. So it's about actually really talking to it from an individual community um, kind of level and allowing those people that make the choices to be 
to, to, to be the ones that become the norm. So F, like, you know, ending FGM, which is something so massive, it's not dissimilar to things like I say in the UK in, in terms of social norms, like um, smoking bans, wearing seat belts, drink driving. You have to create a, as much as you have the legislation and the opportunities for women to be able to advocate on behalf of young um, children at risk. You also have to be able to create that social norm of acceptance. So it's a multifaceted kind of layer. And that's why I believe in um, funding um, grassroots activism who can actually um, elevate those conversations about the values of women in those communities and say, actually, this is what an educated community, this is what an educated woman looks like. My mother is um some so so my mother is going to be um 60 um like um, next year god willing um and ultimately the fact that the first like you know girl the first adult like child she's seen that hasn't been cut is one is um 11 and, and one is 10 so we are living in a place where they'll be seeing uncut women grow up for the same time they're also going to have conversations they're going to have fears in their um, old mind. So it's about really appeasing that. And even in my own experience, I remember I I, I was demanding an apology from my mom for a long time from a, from a very angry um, kind of place. And I realised actually that I I am beyond my FGM more than she could ever be. So it was in my position to actually um, forgive my mom rather than demanding her forgiveness. So in that conversation, it's actually quite like you know we have to take the power balance away, and that's where the economic development comes in. But after that, it's ultimately about healing and truth and reconciliation through both women and their mothers and their grandmothers and actually really understanding that this was something that they had very little control over. We have time just for, um, I think, a few sort of final question thoughts and, and resources. But someone did ask early on, and I want to make sure that we get to it. When FGM happens, um, what is the intended outcome? And and what I'm hearing in terms of this story is, is not wanting to create sort of otherization and then also the ways in which it's used to kind of control women's sexuality. Um, are there other intended outcomes for FGM that people use to justify it? But you know what ultimately when women do it in terms of like when you're harming somebody you love and you have this kind of conversation it is about sense of belonging and a sense of identity and the reality is that you can actually I can I can sympathize with my mother at the same time as like you know condemning what she what, what she did so there has to be the ability in order to have humanity for women who've also experienced this act of FGM and once you break a cycle you also have to take you have to take a task about your experience and 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 your place in society so ultimately it is about disrupting that position in society so not only are women who basically took girls out of this country in order to be cut um cutting their um daughters but they're also going to be raising them in a different kind of culture for the first time so it is quite scary for those women so they i, th I think the, the reality is that we can understand the act as being wrong, but also be able to sympathize with the, with, with the oppressor because they are a survivor themselves. So th there's a level of complicity and then there's, there's and then, and then, and then there's, there's also a level of like, you know, um, vulnerability for when women do it. But I think it's really without without the disrupting the power balance, um, balance then that we can't have those conversations. Mm. Um, I have a question from uh, someone who wants to know what we here today can do to best support you and your organization. Yeah, so please, like, you know, if you can follow the Fight Foundation on um, Twitter and Instagram, please do. If you can donate, like, every penny goes to women on the front line. Or if you can, like, you know, organize and help us kind of um, write to philanthropy, at, like philanthropies in the US and the US government to say, actually, we need to just shift the, uh, the, the power balance by, like, you know, giving money to women rather than giving it to massive NGOs would be more than incredible because I think, like, you know, as citizens collectively, we can really um, change the trajectory of humanity by ending FGM. And then I think our, our final question is for those who are wanting to learn more, to be a better ally, what are some resources that are available? And of course, following the Five Foundation, but are there other sorts of recommendations that you have for them? Um, I would definitely say um, Ayan Hersi Ali has an incredible book about her experience of FGM. Um, there's Nawal Adesalawi, and then there's an incredible film, which I think is, is on YouTube. Um, but if not, I'll try to get a link for you. It's called Jaha's Promise, and it's about a young American Gambian girl that goes to um, Gambia to ban FGM. So that kind of really shows the fact that our ability to ally ourselves with um, young African women can really change um, things on the ground in Africa. 
And we will um, put all of those resources into a follow up email for all of those of you who are in attendance so that you can have that information um, moving forward as well. My final uh, question for you is, is there anything um, that you wish that we had asked you today that um, you want to share with us? No, no, no. It's been, no, it's, no, it's been brilliant. Thank you so much for having me. I just want to say that I think like, you know, I don't know how many people are on here, but we all have the power to make change. So my favorite African proverb is if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I think together we can end FGM by 2030. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you sharing um, the experiences that you have had as a leader with the Phi Foundation and your own personal experiences and also really I think activating those of us who are in attendance today to do more to support the Phi Foundation as well as other initiatives to empower women and girls around the world. Um, I want to do a special thank you as well to the AHA Foundation for, um, for sponsoring our talk today and of course the co-sponsors of the Multicultural Center. Um, and Habiba. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you, Nemco, for the informative speech and for coming today. Yes, uh, give a round of applause. I know you cannot see the participants, but I think they are already giving you a round of applause. And thank you so much for your amazing work fighting FGM uh, and gender-based violence against women and girls. Thank you for coming today. Thank you very much.